Hi, this is Dr. Carl Goldcamp. A um, few things I have to say. One is we personally are involved both as a lifestyle, a ketogenic diet, but also through my 16 years of clinical practice of what is effective. What do people need to take sometimes, all the time, to support their ketogenic diet? You'll get bits and pieces of this ongoing week after week. It's important to be comprehensive. In one way, it's simple. and one way, it's a little bit complicated. Welcome back, everybody. This is Dr. Carl Goldcamp inviting you back for another episode of the Keto Naturopath. Today we are going to break stride with all the fundamental questions and laying down of basic information that the previous episodes have included. Today we're actually going to interview somebody. This person has the credential in my life of having saved my life. So you're kind of wondering, who am I going to interview? Well, that's the first thing. The second thing is this person has been what I would say, she's our, my first ketogen interview. A ketogen is a person that, in my perspective, it's a word I just made up, which I think is quite valid, somebody who's been diligently on the ketogenic diet for two plus years, so ketogen. All right, so who is this person? This person happens to be my wife, Judy LaCava Goldcamp. And we're going to talk to her about a number of things, but primarily what qualifies her to be the number one person I'm interviewing it's because she had cancer. She had brain cancer. It was a tumor. And we're going to start with that. So back when you didn't know what was going on, what was the first symptom of your tumor? Or that something wasn't quite right? I started losing the sight in my right eye. And at first it was just fuzzy sight. And I thought perhaps I had scratched my eye. And I went to an eye doctor who sent me to an ophthalmologist who sent me to a retinal specialist to try to find out what was going on. And three years, three and a half, four years later, I was diagnosed with a brain tumor. Okay, we skipped a part here. So what happened when you finally got to this retinal ophthalmologist who is basically the best in the area per your understanding? What did he say? What was his, he had all the, all the information given to him by the previous visits you had of the other doctors. Well, he took several tests, and first he said that there was a fluid leakage, and he thought it was very strange because normally that only happens in men, not women, because this should have, you know, been a red flag to me because it's usually the men who have the jobs, who have high-stress jobs and on and on, but I had an extremely high-stress job. And then subsequently he kept telling me, it was my losing my eyesight was all due to stress. And I believed him because, as I said, my, my job was extremely stressful. And there were other things happening in life that added stress onto that. So I believed him. He kept trying to tell me to meditate and calm down. How did you use that information saying, okay, it's due to stress, uh, lower the stress? Did, did that... Did that mean anything to you other than if I stop stress, everything's going to go away? Did it, it was just a thing that you either took care of, you didn't take care of? He said I would never get my sight back, but just said to reduce stress. And given the situation I was in at the time, it was impossible to reduce any stress because as I said, of the job that I had. So, you know, I did try meditating and all that, but nothing was going to reduce the stress that I had. Okay. So that was year one. You saw him again a year later. And was the advice still the same in the diagnosis? Yes, the advice was still the same for the next three years until I went back to him when I completely lost the sight in my right eye. I could not see anything at all. And his advice at that point was that I was trying to block something out in my life that manifested in me losing the sight of my eye but before he sent me to a psychiatrist, he was going to send me to a neuro-ophthalmologist just to make sure. So this is now at the end of your third year of visiting him each year, and he still said more or less the same thing. It's stress, it's emotional, but hey, heck. So you went to see a neuro-ophthalmologist, which was a couple hours away at Yale, right? Well, she was in New Haven. In New Haven. That's right. And it wasn't associated with Yale at all. St. Raphael's. And so... What happened? This person, you went in and what was the, did, was it just sort She of... freaked out. She just looked at my eye and freaked out and said, you need to go have an MRI tomorrow. 
and then you need to go see a neurosurgeon. And so I had an MRI scheduled for the next day, and she called me back at 5 30, 6 o'clock, and said, You have a tumor pressing on your optic nerve, and you need to see a neurosurgeon. Okay, you're still working at this point, still very stressed. And now you went to see the neurosurgeon yes. that the neuro ophthalmologist recommended that you see. Yes. What, what happened with the neurosurgeon? Well, she thought because of the location of the tumor, she was hesitant to do surgery to remove it. She thought I would have a stroke on the operating table. I could possibly die or be paralyzed by the surgery. So she was going to meet with her colleagues, four other neurosurgeons, to discuss my case to see if she should attempt surgery to remove the tumor. She got back to you, obviously. And what did she explain? What did you see, by the way? I mean, so you went to visit her. Did you get to see your tumor? Or was this all... Well, yeah, she showed me the MRI. I'm not quite sure what I was seeing, but she showed me where it was um, lying on top of the optic nerve and was starting to travel to the other eye and down my nose. So she decided that she was going to do the surgery. She gave no guarantees that I could still have a stroke on the operating table, I could wake up and be paralyzed on my left side, and there were no guarantees of every, anything. And she also did not know, once she got me in the operating room, whether she could remove the tumor, because some tumors are soft and some are hard, and if it was hard, there's no way she could remove it. But if it was soft, she could attempt to remove it. Basically suck it out with some fancy equipment. I'm just going to inject here. I know this is your story that I was a silent passenger here and watching this. When we got to see the digital imaging of uh, CAT scan and, and MRI and uh, contrast MRI, that it was the size of a very large plum. It was so specific. It wasn't vague at all. It was like a marble. And that was very, very surprising in a, a negative way. So, okay, now we got all this information and... She feels that, well, it's better to do surgery and not to do surgery. The backup was going to be the radiation. And that was a far less certainty or less certain. How soon after did you have the surgery after this particular series of conversations? Well, I was diagnosed in November of 2012. And I had the surgery February 28, 2013. Okay, so it's almost, it's about uh, three months later. So the reason the three months was why? Why did she say, hey? Well, it, it, she sent me for several uh, more MRIs to get more specific imaging so that when she did do the surgery, she had very good imaging and would know what she was dealing with. And the other reason was she was going on vacation and she didn't want to do the surgery before she went on vacation. She wanted to wait till after vacation. Yeah, there's that. Well, there was also a fourth reason. We forgot to sort of ID the diagnosis, which was, was meningioma. And so the meningioma is very slow growing. So me, what little piece of the conversation that I remember said, it is very slow growing and it'll probably be no change in the next three or six months, but it's slow growing. So that's why there's no rush. And then the other things. All right. So then we go in for the surgery. Yeah. What were your feelings about going to the surgery? Um, I, I had total confidence in my neurosurgeon. She was amazing. I wasn't nervous or anything ahead of time. It's just whatever happens, happens. I could, did not have any control over any of it. So I just went in hoping for the best, not knowing if I was going to wake up paralyzed or fine. When do you first remember me showing up back in your life? <laughs> well, the day after surgery when I was in, um, the intensive care and I woke up and asked if you were there and you we lived over an hour away so you had not arrived yet so basically that's it you're kind of out of it you don't really know anything so they keep you pretty sedated yeah we lived almost two hours away per my reckoning and yeah no I counted the minutes while I was in the cafeteria for the whole day before okay so now we're on the other side of that and we still don't know if it was successful or not it was basically successful because 
Nothing well, it was worse. successful because in, in one sense, she said she was able to remove the entire tumor because she had just gotten some new gizmo that allowed her to remove the entire tumor. And they had somebody in the operating room measuring my neurological functions. functions. Yep. So. Okay, good, good. All right, let's go back. So that so she had a meningioma. It For three years, it was misdiagnosed. It grew larger. It impinged upon the optic nerve. She did not regain the vision of her right eye. So what's what are the causes that we can guess? And nobody can go back with any sort of definitive certainty to think that they know what the cause was. Could be environmental, could be certainly stress, and people don't know how to interpret stress. And another thing they say, it could be hormonal. They don't have any clue of why the right. tumors form. So in your perspective, do you go back and say, you know, I think, you know, what was your own sense of intuition? I'm not asking for any sort of medical interpretation. What do you sense was the thing in your life? So let's say it was stress. I, I have no idea. They don't know what causes it. I don't know what causes it. Could have been a lot of things. So I don't even, I don't even hazard a guess as to why. Can I say basically when it, the stress in your life was you were doing two jobs. She was doing her own full-time job as a database analyst, and she was also my front desk for our medical practice. And so at looking back, it's pretty unfair to have her be doing both. We were both doing 24-7 on our occupations at that point then. So now how are you going to heal? I mean, was there, did, you, did you turn a, a page and you're no longer working? And how did that happen? What happened after your operation? That was Well, I... It took me longer to recover than I had thought. I was on medical leave for 12 weeks. And, you know, for eight weeks, I had to sleep sitting up because it was, she was, as she would say, she was in my brain. Um, and I couldn't lie down because of the pressure. I couldn't, she wanted me to walk, but, you know, Connecticut in March and April is really cold. Uh, so I did not want to go walking outside and I couldn't walk by myself. You would have to come with me. And she told me, do not walk on a treadmill, but it was the only time I could walk. So I, I cheated and I walked very slowly, like less than one mile an hour on the treadmill because I knew that exercise was going to help. Um, she also told me when she, when I was leaving the hospital, she also told me, do not go near any children because you'll scare them because I looked like Frankenstein. So basically what I did, Carl took a very good care of me. He had to cook all the meals, which he doesn't normally do. Unfortunately, um, Carl was, had, was also recovering from an illness where the doctors were telling him to eat what I think is crap food and what we had never eaten before. So I pretty much used that as, as an excuse for you to go down and buy me muffins and croissants and you know, I just ate garbage, bagels, croissants, sandwiches, all the stuff that we never eat and hadn't eaten for the past 15 years. Let's say forward about six months, now you're having a life back, right? You're, you've healed somewhat. How's your thinking? Well, how's, your, how's your mental function? Well, what happened actually was that after 12 weeks of medical leave, and I had cleared everything with my company to go back to work part-time and cleared it with my doctor. And the day that I was to go back part-time to work, I got laid off. Incredible. So the good news is I wasn't stressed anymore because of that job because I was wondering how I was going to go back to that stressful job given the brain surgery I just had. But I was still getting headaches and fatigued, which my doctor said should not be happening at that time and she had me sent for all these uh, tests for hormones to make to see if there was something wrong and everything was fine and she had no idea what was causing my fatigue and my headaches and at the time we were we were getting ready to sell our house we decided we we both near death we were going to sell the house and move someplace that we thought we'd really enjoy which is Cape Cod, Massachusetts and as I would I was on the computer looking for places to rent. I realized that it was while I was on the computer that that's when I got headaches and fatigue. And when I went back to tell to visit my doctor, she I, I just happened to tell her this as we were walking out of her office. It's like, oh, by the way, 
I found out why I'm still getting headaches. And then she just looked at me and said, you can't work anymore. And I'm like, what, what do you mean? And she goes, if you're getting headaches and tired from being on the computer and that's what your job is, 8 to 12 hours a day on the computer, you cannot work anymore. So I, that pretty much ended my career. How did you come to get involved with the ketogenic diet and why did you get involved with the ketogenic diet? Well, given, given this context. Uh, you, you had, just before I was diagnosed with the brain tumor, you had been diagnosed with severe Crohn's disease, which... And ulcerative colitis. Which just came on suddenly. And you were actually looking for a diet which would help you to heal because you knew that all that white rice, white bread, white flour crap that your doctor was telling you to eat wasn't really that good for you. So you searched and I'm not sure how you found it, but you found ketogenic diet. We started watching a lot of YouTube videos and that's pretty much why we began the keto. We first started paleo. We did paleo for two months and then switched to ketogenic. That was pretty much January, February of 2014. Right. It's hard to remember all those dates. Okay. So you're going on because you're thinking, well, you had to lose weight from the surgery anyway. You now have time to sort of focus on a diet again. And did this have any effect for you? I mean, it's, what was your experience? Now we're going forward with this, uh, I would say in my mind, initially this contrivance of a diet, which is looking at your macros and we're saying this can't possibly be that helpful, but it's a way of looking at it. And there's enough documentation and we did some reading. Yes, initially, I lost 10 pounds immediately and, and thought, wow, this is a miracle. But then actually after that, I struggled and I started to gain weight. I, I have, a, have been struggling with my weight since I was seven. And in the past few years, anything I tried, nothing worked for me to lose weight. And I tried a lot of things. So for me to lose 10 pounds initially was pretty amazing. And then, you know, I was tracking, I was counting, and I thought I was doing everything great. And I started gaining weight and uh, that bothered me. And I remember something, we were at a, the metabolic conference. Metabolic therapy conference. Therapy conference. First and, one in Tampa. And, and I, I just, I told somebody there, the ketogenic diet doesn't work for me. I keep gaining weight. And Carl is so mad at me. Even to this day, he says, I can't believe <laughs> you sold that to the person. And I said, I was being honest. I was gaining weight. Oh, let me interject here. She told it to two people. One was Dom, Dominic D'Agostino, and we all know him if you're, you know anything about uh, ketogenic diet. And the other was a Dr. Mary Newport, and you know about her if you know anything about Alzheimer's. So kind of funny people. They were both very nice and said, tell us more. Can you imagine that? Go ahead. So then I decided I, um, I'm not sure how we learned about intermittent fasting, but uh, being on the ketogenic diet, we stopped being hungry at breakfast and we pretty much didn't eat breakfast, but we would have our fatty coffee in the morning. Uh, and then we was still keto, started intermittent fasting, and it was amazing. It was like, I didn't think I was doing anything, but it was like the fat was just dripping off of me and clothes were hanging on me and I was losing weight. I, I lose weight very slowly. So if I lose a half a pound a month, I'm ecstatic. And if I just stay equal in a month, I'm fine because at least I'm not gaining. And I only weigh myself once a month because I have a hate-hate relationship with the scale. And weight fluctuates so much day by day that if I weighed myself one day and say I weigh 100 pounds and the next day I weighed because of maybe I drank too much water the day before and it was 100 and a half, I would be depressed and I would just go eat cookies. So I don't like to weigh myself. But starting intermittent fasting and probably for like seven months, 
it, I just was losing weight, losing weight, losing weight. So that was pretty amazing to me. Okay, let me get specific on this. So when you were saying intermittent fasting, let me say, so you wake up in the morning and you have what, cough? What back then? Black, you, black, uh, coffee. black coffee. Okay. So intermittent fasting is you don't eat for 16, 18 hours and you have an eating window of eight to six or four hours. So we would stop eating at 7 p.m. and would only have a cup of black coffee in the morning and then we would, or I would break my fasts about 11, 30, 12 o'clock in the afternoon with a fatty coffee. And by me, by me and fatty coffee is coffee with coconut oil in it. And we also put a little bit of collagen in there. So that's how I would break my fasts. And then an hour or two later, have a couple pieces of bacon and then have dinner. So that's pretty much what I did for like seven months. Nice. And so that coffee, by the way, whatever you want to refer to it, has evolved a little bit for us. We now have uh, turmeric in it and we also put a little C8 in it. So that's pretty much our afternoon coffee. So our coffee is black coffee with C8, turmeric, ginger, cinnamon, and black pepper. That's right. We stopped the coconut. And sugar. It's not sugar. Salt. And salt. Yeah. Lots of salt throughout the day. Wow. Okay. So you discovered that. And so now you, uh, you've you actually, for the most part, for what I've seen, you finished dinner around 6.30. So you're pretty much 6.30 up until you eat for the next day. You can either call your, your coffee a, a break that you're actually getting some fat then. Then you have some bacon or something in the afternoon as a small snack. And then you're eating 6 o'clock to 6.30 and that's your... That's it, yes. That's it. And you're good with that. Yes. It's quite an evolution here. So what do you think about... So, it? Go ahead, sorry. Well, and then just after that, everybody knows the carb creep. The carb creep is when you pretty much stop counting and count, and charting whatever you're eating. And I started to gain a little weight back. So I decided to go really strict keto where for three months I was going to chart everything I ate. I was going to test my blood glucose three times a day and um, ketones every once in a while, but I wasn't really concerned with ketones. So I did that for three months. I learned a lot by charting my glucose and taking my blood glucose levels three times a day. And tracking your I, macros. That's and what and tracking my food. But I was, what I learned was from charting my blood glucose. And that taught me a lot. I have a family history of diabetes. My sister has uncontrollable diabetes. My mom had it. I think seven of my mom's nine siblings had diabetes where they were taking insulin. Her father was taking insulin. So I know that I have to be very careful and I've always tried to be. So for me, charting my blood glucose was important. But also charting all of my food, and I, it's a pain in the butt to do, and I hate doing it, but for three months I did it, and what I learned was, at that point, I was eating too much protein. Too much in regards to what? How'd you measure too much? What was too much? I was eating about 70 to 75 grams of protein a day. I'm not a very big person. So, and I found that for she's, me... She's 4'10". I'm not 4'10". Five, five feet? What are you? I'm, I'm just under five feet, but I don't know where you get these numbers, <laughs> Carl. Sore point, sorry. And I should be eating between 55 and 65 grams of protein a day, so I had to cut back on my protein. Okay, on that, where you say we should be, where did you get that calculation? Did you? Is it a for your, what I'm asking for? What calculation do you use for you? to find out what this guideline is. Is it at grams of protein per kilogram of body weight per kilogram of lean, lean mass? body mass? Lean body, body mass, okay. So And we have a Yunmi scale which will tell you the percentage of fat. So subtract the pounds of fat you have and that's what I calculated as my lean. Yep, okay, good. So there was a real formula and you had your food scale out there and you went through the tedium of uh, for the most part, three months of weighing things out. So you got to the point of you could tell in a steak how much fat was in that and how much protein was in it. Is that right? Correct. 
That's a big deal. And I started losing weight again when I started tracking and weighing. And so I, I lost weight again because so-called lazy keto, when you, lazy keto is when you don't track all these things and you don't measure everything, that for me, I started eating too much. You eat a little more without realizing it. You know, one more cup of vegetables, more Brussels sprouts, more um, whatever, and even more protein, and just wasn't working for me. So if ever one stalls or whatever, just go back to tracking everything, weighing everything, do your blood gl glucose measurements, and see where you are. And we're, everybody's individual, so what works for me may not work for somebody else. And you have to see what works for you. Other people could probably eat a few more carbs than I can. And and one thing is that keto, keto-fied treats. I don't try to mimic junk food and keto-fy it because one, that doesn't work for me. And two, that's not going to get me to stop craving those foods. The whole idea, in my opinion, is... You want to stop eating bread. You want to stop eating cookies and muffins. Occasionally that's fine, but as an everyday occurrence, you're not breaking the cycle of those cravings. So I also find, you know, I, I can't eat a lot of nuts. So I actually don't, I rarely eat nuts. I don't make anything How with, did you come to that conclusion? How did you find out that, you know, uh, nuts don't work for you? It, it's not Just a, from tracking. You track what you eat and you can tell. And I don't make things with the nut flours or even coconut flour because if I'm going to eat carbs, I want a vegetable. <laughs> I'm going to eat kale. Um, so one time I did, I, it was not this year, last year, um, St. Patrick's Day, and I always used to love making Irish soda bread. So there was a keto recipe for Irish soda bread, and I made it. It was absolutely delicious, but I ate the whole thing in one day. And then I wanted more. So then I realized I You're can't with, do this. playing with fire. Can't do this. But even ice cream. Let me interject for a second. Judy loves to cook and she's the chemist in, in the kitchen. And I mean it. I mean, she has her fancy tools out there and she has what I consider a drill set in disguise of kitchenware. But she can mix, drill, put these things together. And she loves these things. With, you know, more sophisticated and complicated, she's into it. So in terms of ice cream, uh, she's done... A number of different versions of this, you know, drilling down to what works and other things. So, all right, back to you. And it, it's a, we don't eat dairy or very little dairy. So I have a dairy-free ice cream recipe and made with xylitol because neither Carl nor I can tolerate erythritol. We'll get headaches and lightheadedness. So erythritol is not even an option. Carl likes stevia. I don't like the taste of stevia. So if I make something, I'll use xylitol. But even at that, and the ice cream is amazing. And I remember one time I made it and we're like, this is delicious. Carl's like, we'll make some more. So I made another batch that same day. And two batches later, it's like, wait a minute, maybe we shouldn't be eating this that often. So I haven't made ice cream in nine my, nine months or whatever. So, and then we used to make cheesecakes. And uh, interesting, when I first went keto and very strict keto, I made a few cheesecakes with very little sweetener. And again, it's with cream cheese and we are dairy free for the most part. But I would find because of the high fat that the more cheesecake I ate, the more weight I would lose. That, that doesn't happen now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and maybe because I'm pretty much at my goal weight and I weigh about what I weighed in high school so I don't have a lot of weight to lose and so it's I try not to make a lot of those treats so usually Christmas birthday maybe a special holiday so maybe four or five times a year I will make a special treat but again nothing with Almond flour, coconut flour, anything like that. Yeah, and no preservatives, obviously. You have this one chocolate cake, which... Mm. So some of these, 
she's reached her perfection. And what happens to the recipe at this point, when you realize it's that good, like she described the ice cream, is that they go into a metaphoric locked vault. We can't touch it, can't come back to it. It was actually Nirvana. And she has another Nirvana recipe. It's a chocolate something or other, but it's like, I don't even want to mm. talk about it now because it, it is, you would, it's just amazing. And it didn't change our blood sugar. But we'll release those as we come out. But they're amazing feats. But it came through her trial and error. For all the times that she made something, you just had to toss it because it just didn't work out, either by blood work, uh, meaning the tracking the, the biomarkers, or we just didn't like the taste, or it didn't sit well with us, headaches or whatnot. Well, it is interesting in December because my birthday is in December, Christmas is in December, and there was a keto recipe for these cookies that my mom made every year for Christmas. So I was going to try and, and make them, and they are made with almond flour. They tasted absolutely delicious. I made two batches of them. I made ice cream, uh, ice cream for my birthday, this chocolate cake for my birthday, and then, oh, a cheesecake just because. So I gained about five pounds in December just by eating crap. And um, Well, not crap. She, she, it was keto stuff, but there, it's keto Ketofied crap. There you go your word for it. All right. So what about blood work? So you became this sort of, I don't know what happened to you, but you got into blood work. I mean, you're, you were, you were asking, you would call your doctor who's mine too, and ask for these specific labs. And if they weren't done, you'd go back and get them done again. And well, go ahead. The, in January, 2016, I had my normal checkup with my doctor. And of course they do the lipid panel and my total cholesterol was 411. What had it been before? About 210. Reasonable. Okay. And she's she's been after me because even at 200 and something to take statins, and I tell her, oh, no, there's, statins are never going to happen in my lifetime. Uh, but her concern was my dad had a triple bypass when he was in his early 70s. So she's thinking it's hereditary. And... So when it came back at a total cholesterol of 411, even I was a little freaked. But my triglycerides were great. My HDL was great. My CRP was great. So Great being under one, which is great. Um, so we happened to go to two keto conferences about a week later. So yeah, See, <laughs> let me interject here. You're not going to guess what's going to happen, but we went to the low carb conference in low carb USA in, in, in West Palm. West Palm. And then the other side of Florida in Tampa about two weeks later is the second metabolic therapy conference, which they didn't have this year. So what I did was Jimmy Moore was at low carb USA. And of course he wrote uh, cholesterol clarity. So I bring my blood work up to Jimmy Moore and had him look at it and he goes, that looks fine to me. And I said, I need to buy your book. We have it on ebook, but I don't like reading ebooks. So I bought his book. Dr. Westman happened to come up to talk to Jimmy when I was there. And I hand my blood work to Dr. Westman. He said, you're fine. You don't have a problem. So then, uh, oh, then you talk to, talk to, Dr. to Dr. Gerber. I show him my blood work. He's like, you don't have any issues. At the David next Diamond. conference, Dr. David Diamond gave a presentation. So here I go to Dr. Diamond with my blood work, and I show him my blood work, and he's like, I don't think you have a problem, but get a CAC scan, an NMR test, and a CT heart calcium score. And the CAC scan scans your carotid arteries to see if there's any plaque buildup. The NMR is a blood test that will give you particle size, which will tell you if your LDL is the light fluffy, which is particle A, which is not a problem, or particle B, which is the dense, which is the kind that can build up as plaque. And then the CT heart calcium score gives you a, cal a score of zero to, I don't know, several hundred, and will tell you if you have any plaque build up near your heart and if you're at a risk for heart disease. So I had the CAC test done, and I, it was perfect. And the next time I see Pause my... Pause for a second. So uh, it is a scale of 1 to 400. I think she had 5. No, the CAC scan is oh, they sorry. scan the carotid arteries. You know, of course, I'm talking to the, to the woman who's doing the scan, and she asked me all these questions. I tell her about my brain tumor and my misdiagnosis and blah, blah, blah. So at the end, 
I wanted to ask, but I knew I could, she couldn't, I know she could not tell me if everything was fine. And she's like, I can't tell you, but you have nothing to worry about. <laughs> <laughs> so I go to see my doctor and she's, again, statin, statin, statins. I said, but look, my CAC scan, there's no plaque buildup. Why do I need a statin? Statins are going to give me diabetes and dementia. And, you know, there's a higher statistical correlation with diabetes and dementia than there is with statins helping with heart disease. And so I asked for the NMR test. So, and we live on Cape Cod, Mass. And it was hard to find a lab that would do it. My se The second lab I went, the first lab, Quest, didn't do it. And the second lab I went to, they said... They weren't sure. It took him a half hour to call whoever to see if they did it. And finally he says, yes, we do do it. So I had that done and um, I'm particle size A, which means it's a light, fluffy LDL and I don't have a problem. But still, I wanted to be certain and I wanted the CT heart calcium score. So I asked my doctor and she said, I've never heard of that test. I don't even know where you can get it done. And I said, well, let's ch check with Cape Cod Hospital. So they had to go through all this. They checked with the Cape Cod Hospital and insurance will not pay for the CT heart calcium score, and which kills me because they'll pay for a lifetime of statins, but they won't pay for a $150 test to see if you have a problem. Just a small interjection. This is, by the way, a required test for all astronauts that they're actually going to go into space. This is their considering the top of their evaluation is looking for uh, calcium in the heart. So that's how important this test is. But we couldn't find it. So she. So I did have it done and came back. I have a. Um, a remarkably a, a, low a, score. A score of five. I was hoping for a zero, but it was a five. And I, don't, I think it's under 200 and you really don't have to worry. So, uh, once again, we go to the Low Carb USA, and Dr. Diamond happened to be there, and I said to him, oh, last year you told me to get all these tests, and it was perfect. He goes, so what was your, your score? And I said, five. He goes, oh, basically zero. You have no problem at all. So, here I am. I had a total cholesterol of 411, but I have no, a very, very extremely low risk of heart disease. And without taking all those tests, I'd be on statins. I would have diabetes and dementia. That's an incredible story. Uh, I just wanted to go back and add some things onto the side, perhaps unnecessarily, but there's a great book by Dwayne Graveland, a physician who died a couple of years ago. He wrote uh, Lipitor, Thief of Memory, which is about statins in particular, and it's a huge association with what they call total global amnesia and some very scary stories. Judy's, Judy's whole determination to get the tests is, is remarkable. And uh, that's really what health comes out. I mean, when I look back to my patients, uh, it was their determination to be healthier that drove the whole uh, change thing, not the doctor advising things. And Well, in a way, it's pretty sad that, and that's just the way the society, that I know more than my doctor does, especially about this. And I'm not saying anything bad. They they have certain guidelines which they have to practice in. And I know that she had to chart that she recommended statins and that I refused them. And I understand that. She's covering herself. You know, it, it's, and I've recommended books. I've given her websites to go on. But <laughs> it's, they work with, and not all doctors. I, I can't say all doctors, but. A lot of doctors just work within strict parameters and they don't go outside of the parameters. So they only know what they know. So it's your body, your health, and, and you have to direct how you want to go. So if ever there's a test and something's recommended, do your own research to see if what your doctor is recommending is just another pill because Big Pharma has a big control over our quote health yeah. industry really which really a, isn't a health good. industry so it, you're the it's your body it's your life you need to do research to know what's best for you 
Okay, now that she stepped down from that soapbox, um, what she had that most people don't have, she has, maybe she's missing the gene for it. She doesn't mind contradicting her doctor. You know, she goes beyond that. And uh, I think that's a remarkable feeling to get for. She does, she's not insulted. She just, she uses them. And uh, that's how doctors should be used. It's like they, the way it is set up here in the United States is that you need to use your doctors to get your various labs or pay for it out of pocket. And most people can't afford to do that, the, the expensive labs. So Judy has just sort of done the works and this is what I'd like and got compliance by their doctors. And some she's had to pay out of pocket for. So are you on any medications? No. Huh. Um, no, no. Next you're going to say how old I am, right? <laughs> I know. Unless we can go there if we want to. I was going to say, are you on any supplements? Do you take any supplements? No, I don't take supplements. You don't take any vitamin D or anything? No. Ever? <laughs> oh, occasionally when, when you say, have you taken any vitamin D lately? And sometimes in the winter I will, but in the summer I make sure I go outside for at least 15 minutes a day and I'm pretty good. Um, in the winter here in Cape Cod, it's, it's tough, but um, so I probably should be taking vitamin D, but in the winter, but I haven't. So I, no, I don't take supplements. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and it's basically because I hate taking pills and I start off for a week and I'm, I'm good. And then I just don't take them. I, for me to take supplements, I have to take them with food. And I never remember when I'm eating my meal to take my supplements. So. So obviously a lot's rubbed off on her being the uh, wife of a naturopathic doctor. So anyway, um, that's an impressive story of where you got to. And it's not completely over and we don't have to go into your age because you do one thing almost every day that I believe you did this because of your health, not so much because now you have some time to do this. You know, what is that one thing you do every day? Go to the gym. That's right. So why has that become a big deal? Well... Does it, is uh, it, does it have any value for you? Are you just doing it? To well, kill? I never, I would, I refuse to do any kind of exercise prior to reaching the age of 25. I would not do anything. But then I started to go to a gym and I would do aerobics and play volleyball and racquetball. And I was addicted to working out. It felt so good. And then I started running and I used to run five to six miles a day for several years, um, and I feel better when I work out. Right now, I'm doing weight training, which I had n not done before, and I want to get back into doing some running, but I'm doing weight training to try to build muscle, and because muscle burns more calories, and I'll be able to eat more. And uh, also, as you age, it's very important to do weight training for your bones and to... Yeah, muscle mass in general. So you've also hired a personal trainer, so you know how, and you have a specific program. So you go in just like you've done everything else, very academic. Boom, this is what I'm going to do today. This is what I'm going to do there. Correct? Yeah, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a very structured person. Right. Yes. So this is uh, not winging at all. She walks around with her clipboard, checks things off, gets her... Um, so it's been impressive to see all that. Any words of wisdom? So you've been on an incredible trip. You know, you've been on an incredible trip for your own life, your own health that came derailed really at the beginning of those symptoms were I think 2009, 2010. And operation was 13, February of 2013. So it's been recent, but uh, you're a remarkably different person in all of that. Well, I, I guess once you come close to death, <laughs> a lot of things that change. Um, I'm very grateful that I don't have that stress from the job anymore. Um, I try not to get bothered by things because it's more of what's important in life and what can you just say, oh, well, that's the way it is, let it go. Um, She's much better at that than I am, by the way. She's, yes, I am. She clearly has learned that <laughs> lesson. And um, I do realize more and more about my, quote, disability, and I don't like to call it a disability, but there are a lot of things that I cannot do because of the loss of the eyesight in my one eye. So I have to be very careful walking upstairs, walking downstairs, walking anywhere, that I'm very lucky in many ways that I survived the surgery very well. You know, life's short, 
What I see in you that is unique is a survival instinct that I see in a few other people, obviously part of patients, but you know, you take loss of vision in one eye, that could be a tremendous, it is a tremendous setback, but it could be a setback that basically some people, they could use it as an excuse, but it's, 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 it's a bona fide excuse. It's like, well, there's a lot of things I can't do. And you, and therefore what they do in their life gets contracted. You're, the radius of activities gets contracted and fewer and fewer. And that accelerates aging. Judy did the opposite. Yeah. It's, you know, she's really, when, uh, she, she drives and so on and so forth. And sometimes I politely make fun of her and, and she thinks politely. <laughs> and so, and other things, but, um, <laughs> yeah, I've learned to temper that, but that she stepped up and gone beyond that saying, Hey, this is what I got. It's not going to stop me. I'll work around it. And, uh, that has been such a definitive thing. If there was a vitamin for it, or if there was a gene for that, she's got that, or she's taking that or makes that, but very impressive. And I, I see that. But getting back to the ketogenic lifestyle, I won't call it a diet, but there are also a few things that I'm very strict keto very strict and and we have our facebook group and i've said in my facebook in our facebook group that you know we're all adults we all do whatever we want to do but if somebody posts something in the group that i don't consider true keto i will tell them i'll say that's not keto and you know don't take it personally it's for a lot of people especially new people needing to know, is this ingredient keto or is it not? And ingredients matter, not just the carb count, fat count, protein count, but the ingredients matter. And that, you know, some people might be able to eat a food that's slightly off keto and another person can't. So it's my job to say, hey, this isn't completely keto so that you know and you can make a choice whether to eat it or not. And I also, and I'm keto for life, and mostly now why I'm doing keto is brain health. And, and if there's any way to prevent my tumor from growing back, and it's monitored closely every year, and yes, I hate those MRIs every year, it's monitored closely, but I don't want that tumor to return. And I don't want the tumor to return and and put me blinded in the other eye. So I will be strict keto for life. Now, strict keto to me does not mean I'm never going to eat a non-keto food. I have occasionally, and I don't call it a cheat. I'm not cheating. It's when I consciously decide I'm going to have this. And, you know, uh, one time I think it was baked beans when we were at some barbecue and I love, always loved baked beans. So I said, I had a teaspoon of baked beans. It was my choice to have it. I didn't cheat. I had it. And I never say, oh, I can never have that food again in my entire life. Because then you're setting yourself up for failure because you can never have it. And I say, if there's some time I really want something... I will have it and then I'll just go right back to keto the next day because I can do that and not a lot of people can. Some people, let's say pizza for an example. Um, I, I love pizza, but I could probably have a piece of pizza or a whole pizza and the next day go back to keto whereas somebody else may not be able to do that. So you have to know what your limitations are. And a lot of times we've gone, we went to a conference and I know that we were going to be going out to an Italian restaurant. And I said, you know, if I want some bread, I'm going to have some bread. And if I want something, I'm going to have it. And I get there. This is normally what happens to me when I say that. I get there. I look at the bread. And I say, you know, I'm going to feel like crap if I eat that. I don't like how that's going to make me feel. So then I choose not to have it. I can have it if I want to. But then it's my choice not to have it. So I'm not depriving myself of anything. I, it's just a choice not to have it. It's if I choose to have a food, and it wouldn't be a whole day of eating. It wouldn't be a whole pizza. And I haven't done it. Uh, let's just say in the, what, two, two and a half years that we've been really strict keto, again, I have not had any non-keto food. Right. So I don't like the word cheat because... You're making a conscious decision to eat a non-keto food. That's your decision. It's not a cheat. It's your decision. 
And why cheat? Who are you cheating? Good point. Are you cheating yourself or are you cheating keto? Um, what's your thoughts on food quality? Uh, it, meaning that uh, do you always buy... Well, it's we a personal choice. Okay. I and mean, whether you can afford it or not, some people can't afford 100% grass-fed beef. If you can't afford it, buy what you can afford. I mean, so I why, Hold for a second. I understand that. So there's a price difference. We're aware of that. And you're paying for that food quality. Why would you buy what you consider grass-fed? Why is why do you think that's well, better? Well, I don't always buy grass-fed. I. But why do you think that's better? You, I buy hormone and antibiotic-free ah, okay. meat as much as possible. Why? And this is just a thought. If I'm eating all those hormones and antibiotics that the animal was fed to make it fat, is that going to make me fat? Okay. No, that's the point that I was after. And in terms of veggies, we buy organic. Well, the Dirty Dozen. The Dirty Dozen. Dirty Dozen environmental working group list of the most contaminated vegetables out there, like lettuces and so and on and so forth. And we once again, own. it's not always easy to buy. Not, stores don't always have it. And one thing I hate about organic food, pr produce, they wrap it in plastic. And to me, it's like, why are you wrapping the organic food in plastic? Okay, so what do you do for fish? These are important things. What do you do for fish? Because Alaskan we know... salmon. Well, lucky you. Yes. Okay, do you have tuna? I do, you don't. I love tuna. I will maybe two or three times a year have a can of tuna, yes. Oh, okay, that's not very much. And you, if you developed a love affair with sardines? I eat sardines, canned sardines and canned mackerel. Uh, they're small fish, so yes, I eat those as well. Great. Anything else you want to add before we bring this to an end? We've been going on pretty long and got a lot of good information. Your story is pretty pretty outstanding. Oh, by the way, my lead-in was should she save my life. She did save my life. Am I going to tell you about that here? Nope, not. That's another episode in an entirely different direction, but we owe you that story as well, and it takes its own time to tell. Any other parting thoughts to tell anybody? You've hit a lot of big points. I love the ketogenic way of eating. It's not difficult once you get used to eating the foods. Um, for anybody new starting out, you know, don't stress over it. Make keep it simple. Just keep it simple. Meat, keto approved vegetables, that's it. Just keep it simple. I want to keep this about you. You've toyed with fasting a couple of times. What's the what's that about? Can you summarize that briefly? Because you you now see that as a tool and you kind of have I, this vicarious love affair with Jason Fung because it's yes. two books and everything. Well, I think everybody should read Dr. Jason Fung's book, The Obesity Code. Okay. Everybody should read it. It's not about ketogenic. It's really not even about fasting. It's how we all got to where we are, whether it's weight or whatever. So yeah. that's a book. So And he wrote a book um, on fasting. With, he with wrote Jimmy a book Moore. on fasting with Jimmy Moore. And now he has a book out about uh, diabetes. Yep. But I do what's called extended fasts as well. Well, we both do. And Carl has done a seven-day fast. And I, I've done five-day fasts. But lately, I've only been able to do four-day fasts because my blood glucose gets pretty low. I feel shaky. So... You know, I'm not out to prove a point that I can go seven days. So okay. I usually stop So why do you do this in the first four. place? What is so the reason I do that, for me, is what Dr. Fung said, to reset my the weight that my body likes to be at. In essence, and you're training your body. You're training metabolism that less is better. Less is more, right? Well, he his, no... And his theory is about resetting the thermostat at what your weight, your body feels comfortable at. So I, we usually do a four or five day fast once a month in addition to our daily intermittent fasting. And actually, when I did that, it took about seven months, but my normal blood glucose levels came down. Even when I wasn't fasting, my normal... And stayed um, down for a while. And stayed down. They, they stayed down until I stopped doing the extended fasting. Periodically. And so one once a month, I'll do a four or five day fast. And it took me about six months and to get my normal 
blood glucose down into the low 70 range and also to help reset that point at which my body feels comfortable and to have that at a lower weight. Okay, let me summarize. So the reading was very helpful for her to actually take the action to fast. Um, I'm not going to, fasting is a whole separate topic and it's fun to get into both on our experience and some reading and studies and so on and so forth. How I do the fast is I do have coffee and I do have tea and and sometimes I'll have for this transition, especially for your first three days, really your first two days, really day two and three, um, a little C8 just to sort of bridge me over. And after that, as I said in one of my posts, the angels start to sing and you, you wonder if you'll ever have to eat again. You're just, you know, as long as you have enough water. I'm going to bring it to an end here. We've really sucked a lot of information out of your story that can be passed on to a lot of people. So I hope that some people think, will we'll think of this and realize it's a therapy. It's a, a post-surgery therapy. It's a post-tumor. GD doesn't like the word cancer, therapy. And there actually is some, there actually are some studies now for meningioma and the ketogenic calorie-reduced diet. Interesting that. So I just want to end with, feel free, anybody out there to email me or us uh, any any questions. And that would be, we're changing it to Dr. Carl Goldcamp at, what is our email? Dr. Goldcamp at ketonatropath.com. I was pretty close. Got it's too many emails. D-R-G-O-L-D-K-A-M-P at ketonatropath.com. There you go. So I don't email me that questions very often. You also can get us in the Facebook at Keto Naturopath. Uh, and I hope you'll continue listening to our podcast of the same name. Thank you for your time today. I uh, hope it was worthwhile. We have more topics to cover down the road. Take care, all. Thanks for listening. For anybody who has any questions, feel free to contact me on our Facebook group, Keto Naturopath. Same name as our podcast. I'm open to any questions, and we plod through the good and the bad, the difficult and the easy, week after week.